All right, now we're going to review vectors. Um, and this is a really important foundation um, because you're going to be using it all semester and it's going, you're going to be building on it and using it for the rest of your time in physics. Um, those of you who have taken um, vector calculus are going to find this a little redundant, so feel free to skip over it. Um, but at least do the exercises and make sure that you um, really did understand it as well as you think you did. Um, so <clears throat> much of what you've worked with so far, if you have not seen vectors before, is what we call a scalar, which means the, that when you're working with numbers, it just has a value. Um, it doesn't have a direction. Vectors have direction and magnitude. Uh, and this is how we quantify things like displacement from the, the origin of our coordinates, but also velocity, acceleration. And we're going to build on this and introduce different concepts such as torque and, um, and force throughout the semester. Um, because we're always trying to describe, we're trying to describe the physical world. So we need to describe the direction that things travel. Um, so um, you you know distant directions matter a lot. So if you're if you're traveling, you want to know which direction, not just which distance, but which direction you're going to travel in. Um, so when we draw a vector. Um, we have an origin, um, and that is the tail of the vector, and we draw it as an arrow towards the end of the vector. So if you are drawing the, um, the displacement, if you draw a coordinate system um, here for a dog, and you're going to put the origin of the um, coordinate system right here, and you want to draw a, a vector showing the displacement of the end of the dog, um, you draw the vector from the tail to the head, conveniently in this case, an actual tail and an actual head. Um, the magnitude is the length of the vector, and um, it is always positive. Um, and it is always real for those of you who've used imaginary numbers. And the um, and then there's a length of direction. And there's different ways we can quantify the direction. And we're going to talk about that um, a little later. So the, one of the first vectors that we work with is a displacement vector. Um, so whenever you're drawing, uh, whenever you're describing a physical system, you're going to draw a coordinate system. And the choice of coordinate system is always arbitrary, um, but the right choice of coordinate system can make the problem much, much easier. Um, <clears throat> so if we draw a coordinate system here um, where the origin is at the, um, is it? your tent and you want to know how far away and in what direction you are when you walk to a lake from your tent, the displacement from point A to point B is the vector shown here. Um, it doesn't matter how you get there, um, the displacement vector is always the same. Um, so you can walk a longer path or a shorter path, but uh, the displacement vector is always the same. Um, and now this is this is nitty gritty details. There are times um, when we will ask you to um, draw vectors to scale. Um, and, and there are many times when actually, if you're not asked to draw it to scale, don't bother. Your main goal is to get the direction roughly right because you draw pictures and physics problems to help you solve the problem, to help you see the problem. Um, but sometimes you need to draw vectors to scale and um, then you should probably use a ruler. All right, the displacement vector, we already talked about it a little bit. Um, Displacement vectors are 
the distance, distance and direction between two different points, such as points on a map. Um, so here you can see a few different um, displacement vectors. So if you go on a fishing trip while you're camping, if I went on a fishing trip while I were camping, the fish would be perfectly safe. I am terrible at fishing. Okay, so if you, um, at any given point, so let's say you go to, you, you walk from your tent to point C, and then, um, which is part of the way between point A and point B, and then, oops, you realize that you've left some stuff back at the tent, um, and you go back, and then you go back, so you go back to the tent, um, or sorry, this says you drop the pack of box, so <clears throat> then you drop the tackle box, so you turn, you double back, and then you um, go back to the pond. Um, so this, your first, uh, your first step is that you go from point. Let me get the pointer. All right, your first step is that you go from point A to point C. So your displacement vector is this red vector right here when you stopped at C. Um, and then when you double back and go to point D because you dropped the tackle box, your displacement vector is this purple vector. Um, and then um, when you go to the, the pond, um, then your displacement vector from the tent is this blue vector. Um, you can also define a displacement vector, which is the displacement between spot B and spot B, how much further you would have to walk when you're at spot D. Um, and then you return and your displacement vector is, um, is going to be zero because you're back at the origin. And note that the displacement vector is always defined by how far you are from the origin. It is not defined by um, how you got there. Doesn't matter how you got there. All right, mathematical operations with vectors. Um, the first thing that I am going to start with um, is, the, is some discussion of notations for vectors. And, I tend to be really bad about this. I tend to actually slip between multiple different notations. Maybe not the best pedagogically, but it gets you used to working to, with different notations. Um, so, uh, so first of all, symbols. Most common when you have a vector is to draw a letter. Um, for the symbol of the vector and draw an arrow over it. Um, sometimes, especially when I'm typing, I will use an alternate notation, which is to draw the letter in bold. Um, bold can be a little easier to make, especially in document editors, than, um, than to, to draw the vector signs. Um, and then we often work in Cartesian coordinates. Um, there are a few different um, forms. A, if you have three-dimensional vectors, the um, direction along the x-axis, direction along the y-axis, direction, direction along the z-axis. Um, you can put this either in curve brackets or um, carrots. Um, and you will also see, especially when you start working with matrices, sometimes you draw them vertically. There is actually a slight distinction between the vertically stacked coordinates and the horizontal coordinates. Um, we're not ready for that yet. So there's multiple different notations. Um, I tend to use the vector X for displacement. Um, a number of books use R. Um, try to follow the book that I am using at that point in time, but please have patience with me if I switch notations. 
ultimately it's for your own good anyhow, because you'll see as, as physics majors, you're gonna see all of these at some point. All right, so many different notations. And we're gonna start with um, some basic um, graphical representations of what you can do. So what does it mean if A and B in par are parallel? That means that they have the exact same direction. Um, so what you can see here, let me use a different color to make sure that we can actually see it. So A and B are in the same direction. These two vectors are in the same direction. Um, and we, um, so I can draw two different vectors as long, it doesn't matter if they're the same length, um, as long as they are pointing in the same direction, they are parallel. Um, and we say if they are along the same line, but in opposite directions, they are anti-parallel. Oh yeah, it's also important to know that you can move vectors around all you want. So this vector and that vector are anti-parallel, even though they're not next to each other. Um, anything that is, um, anything in between, we don't use the terms parallel or anti-parallel. So these vectors are neither of the above. For vector A and vector B to be exactly equal to each other, um, they have to have the same direction and the same magnitude, but they don't have to, you don't have to draw them in the same place. They can still be equal. So these vectors to be within the limits of my own drawing skills um, are equal to each other. We also are often interested in when vectors are perpendicular to each other. Um, and we will say, we will use the terms perpendicular or orthogonal or normal. Those three terms all mean making a 90 degree uh, angle with each other. All right, you can multiply vectors by a scalar. So if you have um, vector A and you multiply vector A by a factor of two, it has, has the same direction as A, but it is twice the length. So multiplying by a scalar changes the, um, changes the magnitude of the vector, but not the direction. You can multiply by a negative scalar and then it switches the direction. Um, so it is then twice as long, but in the opposite direction. To add vectors, you um, draw them nose to tail. So if you add vector A and vector B, you can move because you're always allowed to move vectors around on the page. So you, you move vector B up to where it touches vector A. Um, and then the sum of those two vectors is from the tail of A to the nose of B. And, and this also works, we're gonna do some examples, um, but it also works when you have vectors that are not parallel or anti-parallel. So any combination you can draw, um, you draw them nose to tail and the sum, it goes from the tail of the first to the nose of the second. All right. And then um, if you want to do subtraction, you can think about subtraction as first multiplying by a negative scalar and then adding them. Um, so a, a minus B, you basically are just gonna flip B around. Um, and now to add them, you actually, since I don't like this drawing that much, you actually would want to um, draw B. Oh, 
all of the little things you have to click in Zoom. You would actually want to draw B from the tail of A on. So the sum is the is going to be the difference right there. I haven't drawn it to scale, but close enough. Okay, vector addition. Um, as I said earlier, vector addition means that you um, draw things from, you, you rearrange the vectors and you draw them um, from tail to head. So here we're going to move vector A over here. We're going to do A plus B plus C plus D. Or actually, this one is D plus A. It's the sum of A through uh, of A through D. So you can see that D is just moved around. C is um, is just moved around, and B is just moved around. If we're adding them, it actually doesn't matter which order they go in, as long as you draw them all head to tail. So the sum of all of these vectors is going to be a vector R. Well, And here you you can solve these things graphically. Um, it's a little bit of the of a pain. I do have a couple of homework problems I like to assign just to make you do it once or twice. Um, and this is showing what you would do if you did um, negative three b plus a plus c, um, and those are also the vectors. Those are not the same vectors as before. Um, so you would just draw head to tail over and over and over again. Um, if you have to do this graphically, then you probably need a protractor because you want to make sure that you're, you're doing it meticulously. Um, one of the things that you're trying to build up, though, is some intuition. Um, intuition is <laughs> really comes from experience, from having done a lot of vector addition. You want to get a feel for whether or not something is right. Because often when we get into physics problems, you're working in such gory detail on the math that it can be <laughs> that you can be just slogging ahead, get a wrong answer. You want to have some sense of whether or not your answer is roughly right. So these graphical methods are a bit of a pain, but it's really useful to be able to work on um, visualizing what should happen so that you can get some gut check to see if your answer is right. All right, the parallelogram rule. I don't necessarily like calling it the parallelogram rule because it makes it sound like it's big and fancy. It's not, it's just a way to think about drawing these things. So if you're adding two vectors, um, A and B, you can rearrange them so that they have their tails in the same spot. And um, then you draw a parallelogram. And when you're adding them, the sum is um, in the, the direction is in the diagonal of the parallelogram. And if you are subtracting them, then it goes from, uh, then you, you draw along the diagonal. Nothing particularly fancy. Um, that's all the parallelogram rule is. Um, OK, so here, these two, we add them. And their um, sum is the diagonal of the parallelogram. Now we add them, or we, we take the difference, A minus B, and we go from the nose of B to the nose of A. That's all the parallelogram rule is. You also can just, when you're more comfortable with the math, you can just do it mathematically. Or, Remember that the parallelogram rule means that you have to draw some diagonals across the parallelogram and then do a little bit of sanity check to figure out which direction it is. All right.
I think we'll skip this one, which is an example of how you can um, draw the, um, you drive from Tallahassee through Jacksonville, Daytona Beach, Orlando, Tampa, and then to Gainesville, and you can draw use the parallelogram rule to just figure out where you successively multiple times to figure out where you um, where you end up. Or you just say, well, displacement. Let me just I don't care how I got there. If I know I'm now in, in Jacksonville, um, I can just look at the displacement. All right, Cartesian coordinates. Um, we will spend much of the time this semester working in Cartesian coordinates um, because they're, you, you have to start with Cartesian coordinates. They're the easiest. Um, when you get, there will be some times when we will work in polar or spherical polar coordinates later in the semester, but mostly we're going to be working in Cartesian coordinates. Um, and when we do that, we are going to um, draw you draw your Cartesian coordinate system. I do recommend starting almost every physics problem by drawing pictures because um, your picture is going to help you solve that problem. Um, so then if you have some vector, in this case, we've got the, the vector A. Um, and remember, you can move vectors around. We've got this coordinate system. So if we want to draw how long A is, you can do the projection, which means that, um, that you um, are actually going to look at if you need to, if you want to do it mathematically, you can define an angle theta here. Um, and you look at the projection on the x axis. Um, so that x component is called ax. Um, and the um, usually we call the when we have a vector rec denoted with some variable the component in each in each direction you can write it as a subscript so you have ax ay and essentially az um, and you can get the y component now in this case um, ax is going to equal the magnitude of a times cosine of theta. You guys are going to be doing a lot of breaking vectors into their components. Um, you can also use trigonometry to figure out that uh, a y is equal to the magnitude of a sine theta. Um, you are going to be breaking a lot of vectors into coordinates like that. This vector is uniquely defined. If you tell me either it's coordinates in some coordinate systems, usually Cartesian in this class, um, and uh, or or if you give me the magnitude and the direction, usually in that angle theta, and then we use something called unit vectors. A unit vector is a vector with a length of one. Um, so there are then unit vectors in the directions of the coordinates. So here you can see i hat and j hat. Now, engineering classes mostly use i hat and j hat. I usually actually switch into x hat, y hat. Um, so I'm, I'm used to that. Um, Z is usually k hat um, if you're using, so i, j, k, um, I use z hat. Um, I, I like using, X, Y, and Z instead, because it just reminds me what I'm actually talking about. Um, and later when you will work with other coordinate systems, you will also name the coordinate, the unit vector after the variable. Now we can have unit vectors that are in directions other than the, um, other than the axes of the coordinate system, but, we're not going to introduce those today. <clears throat> okay, so then we here we can talk about another way that you can write the vector. So you can write a equals 
a x x hat plus a y y hat. Or if I follow the book's notation, a x i hat plus a y j hat. Now I don't actually care which of those you use. Any um, any valid vector notation, unless I have specified how you should say it, a valid vector notation gets credit. It's probably a good idea to get a little comfortable with different vector not notations um, because now most of you are, at least in my class, are physics majors. So you're going to see all of these different vector notations at some point. So just get comfortable with them now. Um, okay, so then the displacement vector. Um, so here we're going to write the displacement from B to E. So we are not describing the displacement in the coordinate system. Because when we talk about the displacement in a particular coordinate system, we're usually talking about the um, the displacement from the origin. But we can also describe the displacement from B to E. So if you're at your house and you go to the store, um, you don't really care if the origin, or if you're at school and you go to the store, how far away are you from school? Um, your origin might be at your house, but you really want to know how far you are away from school because you want to know how long it's going to take you to get to class on time. Um, so then you can draw a vector from B to E, and you can also, you can break that into its components. Um, and here, there's very specific coordinates. So point B is at um, six along the x-axis and 1.6 along the y-axis. And E is at point, is it two and one along the x-axis and 4.5 along the, the y-axis. Now, I can do a couple different things with this. So one thing that I could do um, is I can write the displacement of V is actually six X hat plus 1.6 Y hat. And the displacement of E, and I used an uppercase, let me just change that to a lowercase. Um, the displace, displacement of E is 2x hat plus 4.5y hat. Now, the displacement of E from B is going to be, I keep drawing that uppercase, um, is going to be the displacement of E minus the displacement of B. So now here I can subtract the coordinates. I have to group the, um, the terms that have X hats together. You can basically treat these X hats and Y hats like variables. Um, and do your algebraic operations the same way that you would um, with variables. So I have two X hat minus six X hat, and that leaves me negative four X hat. And then I have 4.5, y hat minus 1.6 y hat, which gives me 2.9 y hat. Now here you can see very similarly, if you do this graphically, you're going to get the same answer. Um, probably by the time that you're done with this class, you're going to be a little more comfortable um, doing it this way than to do it graphically. It also can be a little easier because you don't have to drive that you don't have to draw everything. But um, 
this gets you, well, if, if you, you still do want to, don't neglect that these graphical depictions because you still want to develop your intuition so that you can look at a problem and figure out if you're roughly right. That has saved many of a physicist. All right. So then um, the, if we break things into components, all right, you guys should have had trigonometry at this point. So this shouldn't be entirely new. You can relate this angle theta um, from the x-axis to its coordinates. So um, you can write tan theta is opposite over adjacent. So when you need to determine the coordinate, the, the angle, this is, um, this is how you can do it. And you guys have some exercises where you're going you're gonna to be doing that. Breaking vectors into coordinates is really important. Oh, you also can get the same thing because AX equals A cosine theta and AY equals A sine theta. Um, so tan theta is equal to AY over AX. All of that stuff that you might be a little rusty from in trigonometry, you're gonna um, you're gonna remember it. At the end of the semester, you're gonna know trigonometry better than you ever wanted to. And then it's still you're still gonna wish you knew it a little better because some of those hairy problems are a lot easier if you remember your trig. Um, okay, so scalar components um, can be positive or negative. Um, they're always giving you the direction from the origin. Um, and this is just saying, okay, well, if you have a negative X component, then it's going to point, then your X component is there. You can also, your vector A is the sum of its X component and its Y component. So here you can see that these are a whole bunch of different parallelogram rules applied to each of the different coordinates. So if you have, um, negative x components, you're just flipping the direction. Uh, and if both components, if both components are negative, then you end up in, um, you end up over here. Um, if you get the basic, the basic principles behind coordinates, that's probably just a straightforward extension. All right. We also usually often extend this to three dimensions and, and we're going to be doing that a little bit later. Um, so as I said, there will be I hat, J hat, and K hat, or um, in my preferred notion notation, X hat, um, Y hat, and Z hat. Um, and then the order actually matters. So if you, um, we're going to do cross products a little bit later. Um, but it, it matters that if this is X and this is Y, Z is upright. This is what's called a right-handed coordinate system. In physics, we basically always work with right-handed coordinate systems by convention. And there's a few cases, especially when we get to rotational motion, where that matters. Because if you don't use a right-handed coordinate system, you will be off by a sign. Um, so... Much of the t many aspects of coordinates are fairly arbitrary, but there are a few things um, in physics you're always using a right handed coordinate system. Okay, so then if the extension to for vectors to a 3D coordinate system, you just also add that Z coordinate and now um, now you have this vector in 3D and that can get a little tricky to visualize. You will get a little bit better throughout this semester. Polar coordinates, love polar coordinates. Much of setting a physics problem up, how difficult the problem is, really can depend on whether or not you set it up correctly. So if you have something that is rotationally symmetric, what I mean is that it looks like a circle in every direction you look 
it all looks the same, you probably want to use polar coordinates. Now, in principle, you actually can use any set of coordinates, and it is mathematically possible to solve it. But it can get really ugly really fast. So choose your coordinate system wisely. Okay, so in polar coordinates, we are using the distance r from the origin, we call that r, and the angle. Um, often you'll see theta, this is using phi, so the angle phi. And then the x coordinate is r cosine phi, and the y coordinate is r sine phi. So if you're converting between Cartesian and polar coordinates, um, that is, that's how you do the conversion. Um, and then, so, so you actually could also write R equals R cosine phi X hat plus R sine phi Y hat. Okay, and then we define different unit vectors. You're not going to see this too much in its gory, ugly detail this semester, although I will make you work with it a little bit. Um, you have unit vectors r, which is along that direction of displacement. So what that means is that your unit vector r hat actually changes depending on what point you're looking at. Um, and then you have, I actually usually, we usually have, call it theta in most textbooks. It would be theta hat, your book here is calling it t hat. That is perpendicular to r um, in the direction of increasing theta. So usually your unit vector is in the direction of increasing the variable. So when, your, um, when r increases, it points along here. When theta increases, it's increasing in that direction. Most of the coordinate systems that you will use in physics are orthogonal, which means that each of your different unit vectors is perpendicular to each other. You can work in non-orthogonal coordinate systems. It tends to make the math much more difficult because <laughs> you don't have, um, because you have to consider things where you have contributions from both. It, it gets a lot hairier and uglier, but most of the time in physics, you're working with orthogonal coordinate systems. My, um, my catchphrase that, they, that our undergrads know me by is a good physicist is a lazy physicist. And what I mean by that is that you should always make choices that make your life easier. Don't work harder than you have to. You already have to work pretty hard. Don't work harder than you have to. Okay, now we're gonna introduce the dot product. Um, the dot product gives you the magnitude of, the, it's, the projection of two vectors onto each other. Um, that's maybe a little sloppy terminology. So A dot B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B uh, times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, and so here you can see graphically what the dot product is doing. Um, now, if you have, if one of those vectors is a unit vector, like x hat, um, then the magnitude is, let's say b is x hat, then the magnitude of b is 1, and you're just left with the component of a along x hat. So you can think of projections along different axes as a special case of doing a dot product. Um, and you will be doing dot, pro dot products kind of over the place. At first, it can seem like it's some arbitrary mathematical definition. It's really, really useful. Now, if you are, if you have coordinates, so let's have a x x hat plus b, but la, excuse me. AX X hat plus a y y hat dotted with b x x hat plus b y y hat. Then you just multiply the components together. So the x components go together, 
and the y components go together. And this is ax bx plus ay by. So the dot product is a, is a scalar. So you, it's how you take two vectors and you multiply, it's a way of multiplying two vectors, which gives you a scalar. The cross product, we're gonna end up using cross products a lot this semester. The cross product is a little bit tricky. There's a few different forms of right-hand rules um, and I always, I have a preferred one. Line your fingers up with A so that your palm is, uh, your, your, here's the tail of A, here's the nose of A, and you're going to put your palm towards B and you rotate your palm towards B and the cross product is the direction of your thumb. That's my favorite one. I want you to do this over and over. A and B here line your palm up with with a so that the the, the beginning is at the tail and the, your fingertips are at the nose rotate it towards b and it points in the direction of the cross product um, so the cross product is always perpendicular to both vectors um, and if you get it wrong, you're off by a sign. And if you use your left hand instead of your right hand, you're gonna get it off by a sign too. So I am going to make you do this a lot. If you're in my class, I'm gonna make you do the cross product a lot, I'll call it cross product dance. And I insist that you stand up and actually physically do it because actually we, you may look ridiculous, you may feel ridiculous, but your body remembers things when you physically do them and you're going to remember it a lot better if you physically do it. So you must endure this exercise. You will have to physically do cross products. And I, I do recommend that you do this while you're studying at home. You can also make a simple memetic, well, a simple device. You just tape three pencils together um, and that will also help you with homework, especially if you have trouble visualizing some of these things. You're going to want to spend a lot of time practicing cross products before you get to the exam. There's nothing more heartbreaking when you're practicing an exam than seeing someone reach up with their left hand to do the right hand rule. If you teach these large lecture classes, you're going to see it a couple times. Your book also use, uses a corkscrew rule if this works better for you. Um, now, in a freshman physics class, most of you are not of legal drinking age, but I'm not going to ask too many questions. If this works as well, you can rotate the corkscrew from A to B and wherever the corkscrew goes um, is gonna give you the direction of the cross product. Um, an example is torque. Um, so we will not actually do torque problems yet, um, but you can look at the displacement from the axis of rotation to where you apply a force. That is the displacement vector. And then the direction you're applying the force in, and then you do R cross F, and that gives you the torque. Um, so it, the torque, um, the torque vector is useful in calculating where where the where things are going to rotate. Um, so I said we have to have a right hand uh, right handed axis. So how do you figure out how that is? X hat cross Y hat cross Z hat, or X hat cross Y hat should equal Z hat. So take your um, palm, line it up with X hat, rotate it towards Y hat, and you get Z hat. That should always be the case. And there, there is a cyclic nature in this. Um, so X hat cross Y hat equals, um, see, X hat cross Y hat equals Z hat. Um, y hat cross z hat equals x hat and z hat cross x hat equals y hat so if they are in order you will get a positive sign if they are not in order you will get a negative sign um, and that's also how you can check that your coordinate system is actually right-handed you're going to be drawing pictures at the start of most of your problems make sure you draw a right-handed coordinate system if you have a 3d problem because if you draw a left-handed coordinate system everything is going to be off by a sign Okay.
And with that, we will wrap up vectors. I didn't go through the notation for how you actually mathematically do cross products. Um, maybe I should do that really quick before we end. Um, so the way we usually denote cross products, if I have a x, oh, uh, let me actually use here, I'll use this pretty empty page. Um, and A cross B. If you guys have used matrices before, this is going to look a little bit familiar because it looks like the determinants of a matrix. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. You'll learn it eventually. Okay, and you draw AX, AY, AZ. B, X, B, Y, B, Z, X hat, Y hat, Z hat. And then we are going to take the top row, X hat, and then you cross out the column and the row that it's in and write another little matrix out of what's left. A, Y, A, Z, B, Y, B, Z. I want to erase that little line. Um, and minus, so you alternate signs going across the top row, y hat. And then if you cross out the row that's in, you're left with a, x, b, x, a, z, b, z. And then plus z hat. And then what's left is a x b x a y b y and then that you're expanding these sub matrices that's the terminology used don't worry if it doesn't make sense we'll beat it into you the beatings will continue until morale improves right so this is slowing down for me. So A X A Y B Z minus A Z B Y X hat. This is totally choked on me. There we go. Um, and I think. Zoom may be telling me that my lecture is almost done. Minus A, A Y B Z minus A Z B X Y hat. I can't see it while I'm drawing, so bear with me. I think it will appear. Um, plus a x b y minus a y b x z hat. It's a bit of a long slog to work through, but it will work. And I think those equations did not end up writing on the screen. My Zoom connection is choked. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to say follow the textbook. Thank you.